This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Says I just your ass. This is my iron. You're gonna acknowledge me. And welcome to the weekend review. It is Sunday, July 28th, 2024. Summer Slam Week is upon us. Believe it or not, it's here in one of the earliest dates I can remember in my lifetime. I mean, it's it's almost the end of July in terms of uh Summer Slam happening. I've never I've never, I don't think, experienced one this early. It's just a little weird. It's it's seemingly always just you know, set in for the third week of August, sometimes even the last week of August. But here we are in uh, the heart of summer, really, as it starts to trail off, you know. And once you get into August, I mean, you're already thinking, for those of you with kids or who do go to school, you're thinking back to school already. You're thinking already, uh, you know, football. You're thinking about... If you're a wrestling fan, all right, it's heading into fall. We're thinking, we're already thinking Survivor Series, are we not? Which then, of course, leads into the rest of the WrestleMania season as that ramps up. Uh, those of you who are baseball fans are already thinking about October. Again, NFL fans, the fun is right around the corner as things start in about, what, five, six weeks? And we'll be back on that train, uh, back into fantasy uh, leagues of those of you who are in that kind of. Uh, uh, that kind of fun, you you uh, are very close to starting that back up. So it's a big transition, really, from July to August because it you're still in summer. It's still hot. It's still you know humid outside, but you'll notice so slowly things start to cool off. And uh, you know, for those of you in the really northern part of the United States, the end of August, you already start to see the leaves turn. <laughs> I mean, so another month and that starts. It's absolutely wild. So uh, here we are, SummerSlam week and we have a lot in store for you as preview and predictions come your way later this week as uh maybe even and and here's what i've been kind of toying around with um this week is actually busy for me on a different level personal level i've got uh, some things going on at the end of the week i'll actually be out of town on the uh, SummerSlam day itself so i'm gonna try to watch it live but i won't be in town um so it's gonna be difficult but um I, i may start back up live shows I know that was a thing I used to do. Those of you who have followed the show for a while, I may start that back up. And if I do, I will let you know. I used a platform at the time called Blog Talk Radio. And admittedly, the recording of Blog Talk Radio was never really good. I now use like Riverside, but Riverside, I'm not familiar with the call-in feature. Maybe I can dive into that. But I'm just letting you know that live shows may be a thing I do moving forward here and there. Because I think it'd be fun to interact with the audience in real time. And that's always dangerous too, though, because then you could have some yo-yo on there who just, you know, some people call in and say whatever they want. It's uncensored. But, you know, guess what? We could always uh, edit that post-production. So there's that risk. But um, anyway, let me know what you guys think about that. Do you want a live show? Would you want that at all? And if you would, for what show? Raw? Would you want it for only PLE weeks? Would you want it for the Week in Review mailbag? Just curious. Wondering what you guys are uh, thinking about, and specifically those of you who are on Patreon. So a great way to go ad-free, though, speaking of which, and it's SummerSlam week, is Patreon. Right now we have a seven-day free trial on Patreon for uh, new members who just want to try things out totally free. You can do that also on Apple Podcasts and do a free trial for seven days. And if you do that, you get all of our content for a week, including SummerSlams, previews, reviews, ad-free. And if you like what you hear, stick with us and uh, join us on the uh, on the paid side of things. But, it, you know, I think it does offer you a lot of bang for your buck on the paid side of things because everything we do, which is like 30-plus well, shows a month ad-free. Okay, let's get to it as we are now in the thick of SummerSlam build. We're really at the tail end of it. And I'm going to start off here. Uh, Well, first of all, uh, before I forget, because I'm terrible at this, I want to give a shout out to a patron, brand new patron here, uh, Neely, N-E-E-L-Y. Thank you for joining us on the SmackDown tier. Much appreciated. 
um, and if you don't have access to the Discord server, let me know. I will give you that link over on Patreon. Okay, so there's been a lot of talk lately about Roman Reigns, and I've talked about him here on this show. I've been steadfast that it seems as if SummerSlam is the time and place to have him return. It's been over 100 days. It seems like it's been 8 to 12 months, does it not, since Roman Reigns' last, last appearance? Perhaps his longest gap in appearances since he went full time on the main roster, minus his COVID, uh, you know, COVID era uh, hiatus. Now, there's been chatter among other podcasters and fans, and uh, those of you on X, about when Roman should return and how he should return. And some of the more interesting scenarios I've heard are that he shouldn't return at SummerSlam. And that they should wait longer. One of the, 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 that particular idea is actually headed up by Eric Bischoff on his show that he does with Conrad. Uh, you know, seems like he's on every show, but uh, they do a good job. And he had said that it doesn't feel like it's time. It's too rushed that the, um, that there is still time to have the fans miss him more. And at first, I kind of rejected that. I've been steadfast that he should return at SummerSlam. It's a big platform that Roman Reigns at SummerSlam, biggest party this summer, would make a big splash. It's going to be talked about massively. There's no more eyeballs on the product during the summer on wrestling than at SummerSlam. And it kind of makes sense. The, the argument is just then, why wouldn't you? Why, why wouldn't you? is really what you should ask rather than why should you? There's a million reasons why you should. But are those reasons for not having Roman return at SummerSlam stronger and more logical and more long-term than those to have him return at SummerSlam? I, I mean, I don't know if I'm changing my mind, but here's the thing. I'm at least more open to Roman not returning at SummerSlam. I guess what I want and what I think will happen maybe are two different things. So what do I think will happen? I think he will probably, although not certainly return at SummerSlam. Now, what would you, what would lead us to believe that maybe he's not returning is that it's been now heavy handed on SmackDown with solo calling out Roman. It started. If you remember him telling Paul Heyman, Roman's not coming back. Right. And then I was thinking, okay, we're leaving it at that. You know, Solo's under the assumption he's running his own bloodline. Roman's out of the picture. He's never coming back. And then unprovoked, Solo then continues to talk about him. That if Roman comes back, he will have to acknowledge Solo as his tribal chief. And then at the end of SmackDown this week, Solo again said that, you know, if Roman is coming back at SummerSlam, that you're going to, you know, you're going to acknowledge me or suffer the same fate as Randy Orton and KO and Cody. And uh, so I, I would think that that's kind of a tip to him not returning at SummerSlam. I want Roman's return to be kind of something the fans are anticipating and not have it be kind of spoiled by Solo continuing to unprovoked, uh, unprovokingly, I don't know if that's a word, talk about Roman, which I don't like. I, I just, it's, it's the fans who have chanted it. I want Solo to kind of disacknowledge it just shove it aside. He talked about Roman once and said, he's not coming back. And I want him to continue with that. I don't want him to just almost call Roman out. I was hoping it would be more of a surprise ish to the most that it could be. And it's seemingly like, it's almost like they're trying to lead us down the path that Roman's coming back summer at SummerSlam, but maybe he doesn't. And, and this is, a, I think a clue that maybe he isn't, or it could just be, Hey, watch SummerSlam you'll see Roman return. We want as many buys as possible on the network, as many eyeballs. It'll create a groundswell, people talking. We can't just wait to see Roman, what he does at SummerSlam. And if they're willing to sacrifice people being angry for Roman not being on SummerSlam, the, one, the biggest PLE of the summer, if they're willing to take the backlash for that and fans will be frustrated, perhaps they have a better vision. They have a better idea. And, and, and I'm all for it. I am very much a delayed gratification person just generally. Not all the time. There are many times in my life, as we all do, that instant gratification is something that we just 
we have to have it. It's a, it's like an innate human need. Um, but I also with wrestling, I'm a big delayed gratification guy with wrestling. And if they have a bigger idea for Roman returning where they get us off the trail and I, I'm more for that than having the WWE kind of just push us to, yeah, he's returning. Solo's talking about him all of a sudden out of nowhere. Then I'm down that. I would much rather be down that path. Like, for example, um, if Roman didn't come back at SummerSlam, we have Solo still lose. Maybe Solo still loses. We have uh, Roman not come out to help Solo beat down Cody after the loss. And then uh, then Solo stops talking about him. We all stop talking about him. And then Roman returns at a PLE in a couple of months or maybe even at Survivor Series. Or hell, what about Rumble? I don't know. I mean, like that's a, that's kind of an absurd length. And do I think he'll still probably return at SummerSlam? Yes. I'm not saying that it's that it's likely he doesn't, but there's a case to be made for that he doesn't. While we're all thinking, including myself, that it's a foregone conclusion that he was returning at SummerSlam, it it doesn't seem to lend itself to be a foregone conclusion because they're now kind of, they're kind of spoiling it on SmackDown for the last several weeks with Solo calling him out by name unprovoked. So it's like, oh, well, I guess Roman's returning. It takes a little bit of the steam out of his return. It, it sounds like I'm complaining. I have my, my complaint tone in me. It's more of just, I guess, how do you thread the needle the best on this? There's no bad way. Let me just be clear. There's no real bad way to re- have Roman return, but there are better ways than others. All return formats are not created equal here. So I want it to be the best it can be. And the best it can be to me would be when we're not really expecting it. Like we may be thinking about it in passing, but they set up a scenario where we're not even really thinking about Roman returning at that particular time. And then boom, it happens, you know, Um, but maybe they don't care about that. Maybe they don't care about it. The fans kind of know it's coming. So let's just uh, let's just, uh, you know, go with the flow, go with the current. And have them get excited for what Roman's going to do at SummerSlam or what he, how he could interact with Solo. What's going to happen? Who's going to beat down who? Is it going to be an altercation? What happens? So uh, do I think something, again, I will be very clear. I do think Roman, they won't be able to help themselves and maybe they have a great plan for his return. I guess I'm just disappointed that if they follow through with a Roman return at SummerSlam, that it was spoiled a little bit by the constant mentioning of him on SmackDown. I, th- there's no need for that. Keep Roman out of it. At least you would have had a little bit of an element of surprise-ish, uh, a little bit of uncertainty that no one's even talking about him since Solo said he's not coming back, and then all, again, all of a sudden, he's coming back, or, or if he does, you're going to acknowledge me. It's like, wh- why are we talking about this? Why is Solo suddenly, by the way, um, I, I guess volatile towards Roman. What, what, what happened? You know? So anyway, I, I spent the first 15 minutes talking about this on, on the beginning of the show, but I wanted to just bring that to your attention that we were all thinking it's a foregone conclusion. And I would, I would uh, caution you that it's not, but does WWE have the discipline to take the backlash, to take the fans going, what the F where's Roman? Where is he? He's Cody's getting beat down. Randy's getting beat down at the end of the show. Where the hell is Roman? Why didn't he show up? But it's kind of ironic. Is this not that we have a a, a return against solo? That is the very guy that we plan so many returns against throughout his four year run. Nearly, nearly four years. It would also be apropos that Roman returns at SummerSlam in which he did four years ago, exactly to turn heel. So sure. There's a bit of symmetry, poetic symmetry there. That would be you know, nice to tell, but to my earlier point, you have a guy that how many times did we say, Oh, Roman will be standing there at the end of the show title up. We know Roman's going to win. And then bam, out comes X, out comes John Cena, out comes the rock and whoever, how many times did we plan that? And it almost, almost, but it did a few times happen. John Cena did it, you know, of of course, famously at SummerSlam, 
Brock Lesnar did it a couple of times against Roman Reigns. So I guess when you look at this, it's funny that we're asking for the guy that was the the, the, the one that we were rooting against to have somebody come out against him at the end of his uh, title match defense be the one that we want to return. It's just the, the whole circle of life here in wrestling is really fascinating when it comes to just how we cheer for who we do. And it's, you could do a whole study on it. Um, anyway, I'll move on from this topic. I did kind of exhaust it a bit, but, uh, again, f- my official preview and predictions are coming later this week. It will be before the SmackDown show happens on Friday. So you won't hear it on Friday. Um, you won't hear the updated review. If something wacky happens on SmackDown. You won't hear it from me, uh, at least incorporated into the preview and predictions. So, um, all right. Well, what else is going on here? I mean, we got a Cody Rhodes uh, interview with him at a bar of some sort in a suit and uh, nicely placing his championship behind him and, um, you know, talking about Solo and he thought he was done with the bloodline and then Solo's back and it was fine. It, you know, I think it was needed. And also it's nice that Cody wasn't on the show. Not that, again, I'm not a big fan of his character, as you know, but just kind of we need a little bit of a break from him. I'm sure the fans in attendance were not happy, but also it's okay because we need a bit of a break from him. Um, you know, I, I think there is there is a case to be made for that too. So LA Knight and Logan Paul, I'm you know, this is a program I'm getting into. The fans are really into this. LA Knight has heated up again. Has he heated up in, in a level to where he was before he faced Roman Reigns for the title last year? No, no, but still it's a, a fun program that I think, you know, you could end up having a title change here. It's certainly the biggest threat to Logan Paul's U S title run since he became champion. And it, you know, these two, I think are going to have a hell of a matchup. You have a guy that is uh, a veteran in the ring. Older for sure by about, I mean, how much older is Logan Paul or rather LA Knight over Logan Paul? It's gotta be like what, 15, 18 years. <laughs> it's, it's a big age difference. Um, maybe 20 years, maybe not. I, I don't know. I think LA Knight's over 40 and Logan Paul is mid twenties. So maybe 15 years, but I think this match is going to be a lot of fun. Logan Paul can do anything, be anything. He has been vastly improved. This matchup I think is going to, uh, as always live up to expectations. It could be match of the night. It could be. I think that you have differing styles, of course, between these two. And is it time to anoint LA Knight? We'll see this week. Logan Paul beat down LA Knight after his victory over Santos Escobar, which admittedly has also been kind of a fun side program. And Logan Paul gets the, 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 the last laugh last night on SmackDown or two nights ago on SmackDown. And uh, I think that that's maybe a clue that you could have LA Knight winning at the PLE. If Logan Paul gets the last word or last laugh next week, I think you can nearly lock it in nearly that LA Knight is probably going to win at the uh, at SummerSlam. But uh, again, what we have to remember about SummerSlam guys is that they are they meaning WWE are really pushing for this to be a WrestleMania level event. They are trying. They're doing everything but calling this WrestleMania 2 during the year. You know, like WrestleMania 40 part 2. That's what they're, they're you know, what I mean, and I don't blame them. They, they should make this the biggest event of the year. It's not me critiquing or criticizing them. It's it, they're they're a for-profit organization they're trying to make money. It's great. I guess the reason I'm mentioning this is that we have to realize that this, if it's going to be treated by the company as on equal footing or nearly, nearly, because nothing will actually equal the importance of WrestleMania, no matter what they do to SummerSlam. We have to realize that if they're trying, if they're treating it as, as such that the outcomes of SummerSlam and big returns at SummerSlam are more likely than in any other PLE during the summertime and even spring or summer, especially. So this, um, this event with big returns on the horizon, I think could be something that is, is a little, is obviously more likely than uh, at any other time in the last, you know, since, well, since WrestleMania, especially, you know, the, the post WrestleMania stuff 
is yeah, for the first two, three PLEs after these, after WrestleMania, you, you're not going to get a whole lot of change. You know, that's definitely for me, the downtime of the year. Sure. December can be kind of a, a lull during the holidays, but uh, I mean, when you look at the, the cyclical nature of things, the WrestleMania results, you're not going to switch them in the next couple months. I mean, of course, tag titles can change. You can have a mid card title change, but the top titles almost never change. Almost never change from WrestleMania, at least to SummerSlam. That's usually your minimum term for the title, massive title uh, changes uh, to, to, to stay, right? The sticking power is usually from Mania to SummerSlam. And then after that, it's kind of anyone's game. Uh, so maybe I should change this. You know what I should do? And I've been thinking about this, guys. I, I've been thinking about changing the name of this show to not week in review, but rather like big picture or something, because I mean, I, I review raw, right? But why am I reviewing raw when I just reviewed it on my review show on Tuesday? <laughs> you know, like, so I, I mean, I barely mention raw and what I do is like, here's the results. Don't forget. And all I do is really like a SmackDown review part two, you know? So Perhaps I just call this like WWE big picture or something. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. Cause it's, it's a weekend review, but is it really, <laughs> you know, have I been fooling you guys or rather false advertising for the last several years? Oh boy. All right. Here comes a pending lawsuit. Uh, I don't know. Let me know what you guys think about that. Cause it's not really a weekend review. All right. Well, as my podcast falls apart, I want to continue on here uh, with not just the U.S. title, but um, what do I want to talk about? I guess Bailey. Okay, let me talk about Bailey. Now on SmackDown, we all know what we ha- what happened here. Tag t- uh, tag match: Tiffany Stratton and Nia Jax versus uh, Bailey and Meechin. Who, which, by the way, Meechin has really been pushed into the spotlight over the last several should I say months? Nearly months, and it's not a bad thing. I think that she has more than we realized she did. She kind of just was the female part of the OC. Didn't do a whole lot. Didn't get a whole lot of time. Was just there as a female cast member of OC. And now she has been kind of thrust into tagging with the women's champion, the WWE women's champion in Bailey. And working with Nia, working with Tiffany. And I think it's been, it's been nice. It's been nice to you know show some new faces in the in that division. And sure, you have potential returns on the on the horizon like Charlotte who I think is nearly a lock. I think it, in some ways Charlotte is more likely to return at SummerSlam than Roman Reigns. It, at least you could you could argue that because Charlotte's been out for a while. I, I, I've been I've been keeping tabs on her on Instagram, not in a creepy way. Just you know, see what she's doing and if she's doing any rehab, how she's walking, her exercises, and like, I'm not a physician, but I have eyeballs and I can see if she looks like she has a limp or anything. And she seems like she's close, or at least ready. To, she's got to be very close to ready to go, if not ready to go. I mean, I really think it's a lock that Charlotte returns at SummerSlam, or very short, like the SmackDown after to kind of set a new season in motion. Um, it's just a matter of, is she going to return as a baby face as a heel? What's the deal? But it feels like Charlotte's been gone forever, forever. Ever since that injury was that, was that an Oscar? She had that flub of a, um, that move on the top rope or something. I remember I'm thinking about it in my brain. It's a little muddled, but there was some injury that Oscar obviously accidentally, um, incurred with, uh, with Charlotte in that maneuver. And uh, so I think she's very likely to return. But Meechin has, I think, gotten a really nice push over the last several weeks. And are the fans getting behind her? Kind of. Kind of. She, she's shown that she's respectable in the ring because we were unsure. A lot of fans were since she's been kind of a, you know, kind of a side character at best. And I think that what she needs is character development. How many times do we say that on the show? She's got not really a whole lot going on from like, what is she? Who is she? We we don't really know. She's just this kind of spitfire. Uh, She can go in the ring. She's got a bit of an attitude. 
it's not a ton there. And there's definitely work to be done if they have any long-term version of vision of her in the women's division being a, a player. Not the face of the division, but you know, a challenger for a championship every now and then, probably a women's tag team champion at some point, which really anyone in the division is qualified for, so that's not saying much. But I think that she it's just nice because she knows she's getting this opportunity that has been really, I guess, not given to her over the last few years. So it's nice. It's nice. And um, it's just I'm listening to the crowd and they're they're behind her mildly, but they are. And as for Bailey, boy, does she, uh, you know, she needs some help still, which is weird to say for a star at the caliber of Bailey, but no, through no fault of her own, she has been uh, forgotten. Now this week, sure, she got more attention. She deserves a hell of a lot more. This storyline deserves a hell of a lot more than it's gotten. Um, Now, Nia Jax, I think, is a very heavy favorite, no pun intended, to take the belt from Bailey at SummerSlam. I think there's a large chance. I don't really mean to be. <laughs> I'm not trying to make puns, but I guess I'll continue. There's a large chance that she does uh, retain. She's probably, or uh, win, rather. Uh, I think Nia, there's a very large chance that she squashes her competition and uh, and wins. Um, you know, she's, all right, I'll stop. There's probably more, but I, I'll, I'll come up with more later. And there really is, and I do like Nia Jax much more than I ever thought I would. I appreciate and respect what she's done over the last year of her career, redefining herself, confidence in ring. And I like the fact that she's not flip flop and fly, not that she could without killing herself or her opponent, but that differing style because of her weight, let's just call it the way it is, is actually refreshing because she's a heavy woman comparatively to the other women. And just really in general, not even comparatively to the other woman. Like she's just in to the average woman. She's a, she's heavy. She's, she's big, but that is it. That's an asset. Oh, there's, there's a pun. See what I did there. That is an asset to her because it, it changes the way you view a match because so many matches feel the same. You have to slow down with Naya. There's no other way, a way about it. You have to, and that's good. That's good. That's good for her. That's good for her opponent. That's good for just watching the product where things don't all feel and taste the same and just swap out faces. So, I I mean, I think Nia's ready to be champion. Now, my scenario, as I spit kind of spitball this, you have Nia win, maybe by hook or crook, and then Charlotte comes out, and maybe they could bring back Charlotte as a babyface temporarily to face Nia as her next opponent. And yes, Tiffany Stratton could cash in. I think they're going to wait on that. She may tease it. There may be a moment. I don't think that you're likely to have Tiffany cash in at SummerSlam. Uh, But if they're all about establishing new talent on a big platform, again, (laughs) you can make an argument for anything here. But I don't think they'll do it. I think that's a platform for Charlotte to return uh, to face Nia Jax at the next PLE. But... Again, Tiffany Stratton, too, doing a nice job. Uh, the Money in the Bank briefcase being destroyed was, was that last week? I think it was. It's interesting that there's no actual contract in there. It's just empty. So it's more of a symbolic cash-in when you're doing it. It's not really like anything in there. <laughs> uh, I mean, which kind of begs the question, couldn't I just come down and say, uh, I'm cashing in now? Like, just tell the referee I'm cashing in. I mean, you could, but they'll never do that because... We all know we the visual of seeing someone hold the hand in the briefcase is it, it's got some momentum behind it, right? Like we all know what that means and what it is. And it's it's a fun picture to, to watch. And, you know, it, it's got history. So they're never going to do it. But it kind of is hilarious that there's nothing in it. Uh, but Tiffany's going to get a new briefcase. Fine. You know, I guess that's the first time one's been destroyed, to my knowledge. But uh and then where does Bailey go? If presumably she loses the belt at SummerSlam, where does she go? What happens to Bailey? Does she find some kind of alternate story? Does she try to challenge again if she loses? Does she try to rechallenge, uh, get get her rematch after she loses the belt and maybe a three way with Charlotte and Nia? Yeah, just uh, again spit, spitball in here, but there's a big change I think coming. There's another one. Yeah, geez, how many uh, 
How many puns was that? Like four or five? Go me. There is a big change coming for SummerSlam. And I think that's a good thing for the women's division. For all you that are saying, oh, she, he's body shaming a bit. Stop. I just complimented Nia Jax for like 10 minutes there. I made puns, but they're all like actual observations, right? Am I saying anything that's, that's a lie? Is she not a large woman, right? So I just know how some people are. Not most of you are fine, but I get the occasional, you know, as they say, yo-yo that uh, thinks I'm being a chauvinist, which I, you know, Hey, don't care. If you think that's what I just said uh, and you don't like objective truth and you're at the wrong show. Um, so anyway, I'm looking forward to a Nia Jax reign. We've had one before. I've been corrected on that. If I just felt like she never had one because it was so inconsequential. But having her as with the women's championship, it needs it. And it's, I hate to say that for Bailey, who newly turned babyface at SummerSlam to face EO Sky, had one of the best matches on the card, did nothing with her. And it felt kind of like, what are we doing here? It's just a big star holding the belt, but there's no, nothing behind her. I think Nia Jax could add a, a flavor and a kind of a change to, uh, to the women's division on SmackDown that's needed. Sure, you had Charlotte in the mix. That'll be fun too, but I don't think Nia's going to drop the belt if she wins it at SummerSlam for a while. So, all right. What else do we want to talk about? I don't mean to be... Uh, I'm definitely not purposefully... You know, reusing Cody's phrase, but um, looking at uh, the rest of the division here, you know, let's look at the men's side of things. We had a tag team gauntlet match and the matches, I think, generally were good. The Street Profits probably had their best night in kind of like a year more. <laughs> I mean, the Street Profits were getting the crowd behind them. Montez Ford obviously does what he does with his insane high flying maneuvers and uh, defying gravity and then you had angelo dawkins too i think overperformed in that match crowd was behind them. they were fired up fired up obviously until they ran into the brick wall of the judgment or the judgment day the bloodline you knew they were going to win they were the last entry they obviously were the right team to win but the the uh ju- the uh, street profits i'll get the name right i think got a little momentum going on SmackDown for the first time in a long time. BFAB backstage got some, uh, some, some actual dialogue. When was the last time you heard BFAB talk again? I'm poking fun, but also I, I, I was kind of hoping these, these, you know, these individuals would take off. The street profits have been kind of a, Hot again, cold again, cold again, cold again, cold again, lukewarm, cold again, cold again, and now lukewarm again. We'll see that if how that goes, if anything comes of this. But we've been we thought they were going to split up. They came close. They aligned with Bobby Lashley. They did nothing. You know, like they've been kind of a weird team. But they show every time they get in the ring that they can kick ass, and I've enjoyed the heck out of it. Um, yeah, I, I've really really enjoyed it. Uh, that tag team turmoil match or a gauntlet match rather was a lot of fun to watch a lot of wrestling. And that's a good thing on a wrestling show, uh, seeing pretty deadly in there. I forgot they were even on SmackDown to be honest with you, which is not good. (laughs) I'm sure a lot of us were like, Oh, that's right. These two still are here. They didn't have a good showing. Not that they were bad in the ring. They just, you know, you kind of knew that they were having a absolutely no chance of winning that match. And, uh, so, Anyway, uh, Bobby Lashley or Bobby Lashley, jeez, um, uh, was it? I think of Bobby Lashley, Apollo Cruz. See, my brain works like that. That was close, right? Apollo Cruz and Baron Corbin, I think, actually had a little chemistry there. Sure, they're a thrown together tag team, of which they're thrown together because they both have nothing going on, but they have a little something there. I, I would explore that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't sleep on this team. Do I think they're going to be champions in the next couple of months? No, but I think there's something there where you put two lost souls together and maybe, maybe they find something. I don't mean that they're going to have a romantic relationship. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you interpret it like that. I mean that they actually as a team had a little chemistry and they're both names that we all know names that have never been really at the top of the card, but we respect 
And I think there's something there. The crowd actually was cheering a little bit for, for Corbin. Apollo has been you know, kind of lost as well. Um, you know, he lost his accent again. He decided to go back to just uh, speaking like, you know, uh, the, speaking like the rest of uh, America without the, the accent. But adopting his native tongue, I thought was a lot of fun. Uh, when he was back holding the giant silver Q-tip, you remember that? With uh, Dabakato? Who, 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 who did they call? I forget his enforcer. But when he was challenging for the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania a few years ago, I think that was the, the peak of his uh, his run that I enjoyed the hell out of. And then ever since then, he has fallen off a cliff. And so anyway, my point about this week anyway, sticking to this week, there is something there perhaps with Corbin and Apollo Crews. And you want to keep them together as a tag team? I'm all for it. They certainly aren't going to be any better solo right now. They're, they're really not going to do anything solo. So putting them together is a good call. They're both mildly babyface. They both can wrestle. You know, Baron Corbin got a victory in this, this matchup to advance to the next team. Obviously, they, they, they then lost. But it's still uh, something to look at. If you also want tag team depth, I think these two could be a part of that depth. All right, now what I want to talk about next, a little bit of Raw, actually, although I'm not going to do what I did last every other week and just go through the results. Talk about Otis and uh, the whole Chad Gable deal with finally him aligning with the Creed brothers, which is a great pairing, great pairing, much, I think even better than the Alpha Academy was. This is a program that we kind of were hoping was coming for a while, it looked like the payoff of the whole emotional and physical abuse that Chad was putting on Otis and uh, you know, Akira Tazao and Maxine Dupree was just that, oh, Otis shoved him. And I was saying at the time, this is terrible if it's a payoff. You know, are you kidding me? Remember, Chad tried to spank Otis on live television. <laughs> and that's the payoff is just a shove, a mild shove by Otis. And I said, if that's the payoff, this if that's the payoff, this is awful. And we're learning right now that no, it's not. And, and and the rivalry cooled a bit as Chad tried to get back into the good graces of the Alpha Academy with the Wyatt Six, uh, you know, kind of tracking down Chad on a weekly basis and targeting him. He was looking for some help, and the Alpha Academy denied his help many times. And now we have seemingly an official feud between. The Alpha Academy 2.0 with Otis and uh, Akira Tozawa and Maxine, who are going to be taking on the uh, Julia, Julius Creed and uh, or the, the Creed brothers and Chad. Now, there's a problem. You may have heard the problem when I described the people involved here in that you can't have Maxine obviously face the uh, the, the the Creed brothers, right? That means that Otis needs to recruit another guy. So whoever that person is will then help maybe do you'll have a six man tag. Now it'll eventually lead to a, a, hopefully a one-on-one with Chad and Otis. I don't even think that they'll make that a PLE matchup. They might, they might. Chad has been, I mean, every time he's out there, he puts on a wrestling clinic and the matches we had with Gunther, we all know were just outstanding. And, so you you could eventually have this kind of like you know tag team match with Akira Tozawa and Wrestler X versus the Creed Brothers and um, some some kind of mix and match that eventually leads to a six man tag. But the match we all want is of course Otis versus Chad Gable. So that they may end up pushed to a PLE. I think it's worthy of one. But I'm thinking WWE maybe not under the Vince McMahon regime now that Triple H is in charge deems that worthy of a PLE matchup uh, that. Again, you, you could even make the case for SummerSlam. We'll see. More than likely, they have a six man a six man tag team match where Otis finds another uh, individual to uh, team with Otis and himself against Julius Creed and Chad Gable. So uh, I'm just I'm I'm enjoying it because it's heated back up, and it tells me that 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 was not the payoff. Again, a shove. If that had been the payoff, I mean it's laughable, but doesn't seem like that is the case, and. Julius uh, or the Creed brothers keep saying Julius. That's one of the brothers, the Creed brothers. I'll just refer to them as certainly. I think I now have an identity. We all know that they were awesome in the ring. 
we know what they're capable of. Now they're put with another wrestling purist in Chad Gable. And I think that this is going to take off in a really fun way with eventually Otis coming out on top and facing Chad and finally getting his hands on him and, you know, doing what we all have wanted him to do for a long time to Chad Gable, who's doing a brilliant job as a heel too, by the way, brilliant. And he continues to be, and he, he's a uh, come a long way from shorty G has he not one statistic too that I want to talk about with CM Punk. And this is not eye opening. Didn't take a lot of time or, or brain power to, to really come up with this, but I put this on X today and I, I said, you know, it's really mind blowing that CM Punk has been back in WWE for nearly nine months since last November. We're coming up close to a year close with CM Punk. And he has not yet had a one-on-one match with anyone. Yes. He competed in the rumble. Obviously we know what happened. He got hurt, but it's really mind blowing that we haven't even gotten a one-on-one match with CM Punk. And he spent the first like two months just going around on raw and SmackDown and running his mouth and cutting promos, which is, you know, CM Punk is, that's where a lot of his money is made is through his mouth, not through his in ring. He's good, good, really good in ring, but his money is made with his mouth, as we all know, and his matches are limited as they should be at his age. And I'm also not blaming him. Oh, he was hurt. Well, of course I know he's hurt. He can't have a match if he's hurt. But I'm what I'm saying is I'm not blaming Punk for the injury. I'm more saying it's just crazy that if you had said when CM Punk returned at Survivor Series last year in Chicago, that we would have not had yet in at, by SummerSlam a one-on-one match with CM Punk and anyone until SummerSlam, it would have been unthinkable. You would have said, how the hell could that happen? Barring injury. Well, we got an injury, right? So it's just funny. You know, if you had said that to yourself before Survivor Series or at Survivor Series when he returned, just kind of crazy how things work. So, uh, But now we have, again, this Monday night, Seth Rollins, who's going to be on Raw, giving his referee instructions to the competitors of uh, Drew and uh, obviously CM Punk. So whatever those are, I'm sure it'll be something along the lines of, you don't touch me, I don't touch you. If you do, you're going to regret it. You know, the usual. Like, what, what, what referee instructions can you give that would be different than any other referee that would not have to give them and it would just be implied? You know what I mean? Like, what, what are the instructions exactly? Yeah. Break the hold at a five count or before a five count, you'll be disqualified. You put your hands on me, you'll regret it. I mean, that may be the only difference is this referee will uh, use physical force to enforce the rules rather than, you know, uh, a a typical referee would. But again, I don't know what referee instructions. Is he making up what he's going to do? Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of funny. Like, what, what the hell is he? What do you mean? Referee instructions? Referee doesn't doesn't get to get, do instructions. The referee just enforces the rules that are already in place by default. That's the role of a referee in theory, but it's pro wrestling. So I guess kind of make your own rules. Um, and it's more of just a, a platform to have these three guys cut promos on each other. That's really what this is. And, and yes, heat up the punk and Seth rivalry. That's been simmering since survivor series of last year. So nine months that's been simmering and recently did of course, heat up with punk Advertently or inadvertently, we'll see, uh, screwing Seth out of a world title opportunity. That also, by the way, was uh, washed away by Priest himself, who said, uh, it's a gentleman's agreement, but uh, don't worry about it. So it's like, uh, all right, well, there goes that. I I wasn't a big fan of that because then it's just kind of like, well, what do these consequences even mean when he just went back on, uh, on that? And anyway. So I think that there's really more of a platform on Raw for these three to just kind of talk to each other and further the storyline between Punk and Seth. But really, it's about Drew and Punk right now. So uh, that's that's what this is really all about. And it'll be fun. All three can cut outstanding promos at any time. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to kind of figure out who's going to win and how. And I have my I have my leanings of who's going to win here. And how, but I'll save that for my preview and prediction show later in the week. So a lot of fun coming this week for uh, WWE for this podcast, as well as we 
trudge towards uh, the biggest party this summer, which is uh, to me, I mean, a lot of people look at this as the second biggest PLE of the year. I kind of look at it as like the third. The Rumble to me is bigger because of the the Royal Rumble match is just so gigantic in what it means that uh, yeah, I don't I don't think you can really do much to, to to overshadow that, and it leads directly to WrestleMania. Whereas SummerSlam, you do have storylines that lead to WrestleMania from SummerSlam. We've seen those long term stories play out before, um, but it's it's just to me it's like the third PL biggest PLE of the year. Survivor Series has to me taken like a fourth spot. You have the, um, uh, you know, you have the, the that war games match that has become fun. I, admittedly, I have enjoyed it, but it's become less about championships and more about just that single match that doesn't have anything on the line. And really, the match kind of makes no sense, as I've said in the past, with the rules of that match. Oh uh, yeah, the match doesn't even start until everyone's in the match. Okay, so just get everyone in the match, and then we'll ring the bell. It would make way more sense if the match, you know, started when everyone started fighting. And that way you could eliminate people as they go. But anyway, that's I guess they didn't want to make it like the elimination chamber. But uh, anyway, uh, so it's really become very much heavy on a war games match and less about championships at Survivor Series. So to me, Survivor Series out of the big four has taken a, a, a number four spot. So to me, if I was to rank them. It'd be WrestleMania, number one, Royal Rumble, number two, SummerSlam, number three, and then Survivor Series, number four. And you're going to rank the big four. Uh, let me know. That's an interesting question to you guys. What do you think? How would you rank the big four PLEs of the year? What's your order? Would anyone really put WrestleMania not at one, though? So I guess it's really, what is your two, three, and four? Because number one, if you don't put WrestleMania as number one, you're just trying to be that guy. Yeah, you're just trying to be different to be different. This is no argument against WrestleMania not being at number one. It, it just, you know, so really it's what's your two, three, and four. That's more of the question. So, uh, but let me know, guys, what you think. Again, as we wrap up the show, live format occasionally, would you like that? Would you want that? Or would I be doing a live show and embarrassingly have nobody call in? That's happened before. I used to do that. And they have no callers and you're just like, oh. It's like going out, uh, you know, to a bar and then no one's there. It's just you. It's kind of like that feeling. <laughs> so I've had that happen. Uh, but I could have just, yeah, I could just run the show as I do now and cut it as I do now. And then if people call in, you could just have a, you know, quick, quick conversation and then move on. So even if people don't show up, it's not too embarrassing. You know, there's always that. But uh, let me know. And also, if you guys want to go ad free again, perfect time to do it. Everything for free for seven days, both on Apple and on Patreon. If you want to go ad free for a week, that is a great place to uh, get yourself off the ad train because I know that it pops up every eight to 10 minutes and it's no fun. So get rid of them. Go on Patreon or Apple. Both of them have uh, have options. Uh, also, Spotify. Spotify is also a great place that you can go and get yourself an ad-free experience because it, it connects directly to Patreon. So that's kind of a cool a cool deal. So again, busy week, guys. Tomorrow will be the um, probably nostalgia reboot. I'll pick out a, a really cool show that we've done in the past and uh, with previous co-hosts or just by myself or whatever uh, whatever I feel like at the time. Maybe it'll be, it, may, it might be something SummerSlam-centric as it will be perfect for the SummerSlam week here. And then we'll have uh, maybe a video or two pop up in the next couple of days with the SummerSlam event. For those of you who are uh, patrons, of course, and on the NXT plus and above, I might be putting some, uh, some videos up. If you're on the NXT base level, I pr you probably won't be able to see those videos, but yeah, you know, that's not trying to get you to upgrade. I'm just trying to give those who are in higher tiers more benefits. Obviously, you're more than welcome to go free or just stay in the NXT tier. But uh, would it not make sense for those who are, you know, contributing more to get more? So uh, that is something that's coming this week as well. Is it's a big week, a huge week in uh, the world of wrestling, and I'm sure that we'll all be talking about potential returns. And those of you asking, I put this out there too. Last thing, beyond Roman, who do you think is possible to return at SummerSlam? You know, not not pie in the sky stuff, not Stone Cold Steve Austin, not Taker, right? Like, let's get off that. 
real world realistic potential returns. I think Gunther, or rather, I'm sorry, not Gunther, but th- there's a program I didn't even talk about, Gunther and Priest, which has been really fun for me. I, I, and, and I hope you guys have enjoyed that as well. Over delivered. I could say that that Priest retaining at SummerSlam is also not impossible. We'll talk more about that, I'm sure, on the Raw review this week with uh, Priest and, and Gunther. But um, Brock Lesnar. What about Brock Lesnar returning? Possible. People would lose their minds. Would he finally face Gunther or would that be more towards a WrestleMania deal? I don't think it's likely, but it's possible that Brock Lesnar returns at SummerSlam. He's been, I think there was more than one time he returned at SummerSlam. It's kind of like his deal. John Cena, probably not. Uh, John Cena's seemingly going to start it, and he said it January 2025 and go a full year and then call it a day. So that's, to me, uh, not likely. The Rock, maybe, but I think, again, he's more towards the end of the year leading into the WrestleMania 41 season, more towards Survivor Series for me. Um, You could make a case for The Rock. It'd be awesome, but probably more towards uh, the uh, end of the year into the, the, the late fall time frame for The Rock to return. Um, Charlotte, I think is a pretty heavy favorite to return. Uh, but let me know what you guys think. Any other returns out there that I've missed that are very obvious or dark horse returns that could possibly happen at, uh, at SummerSlam that, uh, you think, Hey, this would be awesome. Or, uh, or, or maybe ones that are totally, totally off base. I'm also open to those. All right. So, so, all right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. Consider going ad-free on Patreon, and I will talk to you guys next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.